from the Shelter in Place studio of Leslie Jackson, welcome to The Leslie Show. Dara Ackerman is a multifaceted and dynamic songwriter, artist, performer, and peace educator here in the SF East Bay. We met while sharing the stage at the Monkey House in Berkeley. While I was traveling not long after, she sent me her first album, Skyland, to learn for a show on my return. The album became the perfect soundtrack to my journey into the mountains and beyond. We discussed the unusual way Skyland was made and her eclectic life's unlikely intersection with the West Oakland rebel indie rock band Felsen. My interview with Dara takes twists and turns and is accompanied by cuts from her songs Same Planet, Different Universe and the title track Skyland from her beautiful album. So good to have you with me. I'm flashing back to how we met and our first show together. And oh, um, yeah. it's just been such a great arc of a friendship. Yeah, truly. You have your own band called Dara Ackerman. And you are a backup singer for the band Felsen in the Bay Area, which is how we met. We both shared a stage at the Monkey House. You were with Felsen. I was singing with Ira Marlowe. And we fell in love. Yeah. And I got up on stage with you next. <laughs> Oh, so where do we start? You go to college and you're inspired to travel to India. How did that come about? Actually, right after college, I I went to Sarah Lawrence for two years in New York and then three years at UCSB, where I'm from. And I made so many friends from the Bay Area when I was at UCSB. And the Bay Area had really been calling my name for a long time. My parents almost settled there, but they wound up in Santa Barbara because... The jasmine, the smell of jasmine at the at the airport captured them and lured oh, them to Santa Barbara. But it, I think I'm like about an inch away from having been born and raised in the Bay. You know, S- Santa Barbara might have its night blooming jasmine, but the Bay Area has its night jamming blues men. <laughs> oh, oh, nice! <laughs> <laughs> I had to get that in there. Is that the first time you've said that? No. That was amazing. No, it's one of the few th- brilliant things I've come up with. I- <laughs> that is accurate. But yeah, isn't Santa Barbara sort of a sister city to the Bay Area in so many ways? You think it's so? proximity to the ocean, okay. it's creative people, it's, okay. co- it's kind of... Yeah, why not? I've never yeah. thought of that, but yeah, mm-hmm. why not? A little less edgy, a little less crowded. Certainly not as diverse as the Bay. Which, and that's one of the Indeed. things that has really magnetized me to the Bay Area over and over again. Mm. The social movements... The emphasis on social justice in society here is really powerful and really inspiring for me. And I was magnetized up here right after college and spent my first year out of college writing a musical for children about teasing and bullying in the classroom. My former director of the children's theater that had been a big part of my life as a kid and asked me if I wanted to come back to Santa Barbara Children's Theater to direct a show as an alumni for the kids there at that time. And I said, yes. And I told her, I want to write an original show. And I didn't know what it would be about. And I couldn't even believe I was saying that because like, (laughs) what am I doing? It was so fun, but it also really burned me out. Um, I, I had no, I actually didn't have any experience directing theater except as a choreographer in college. And that's different Mm -hmm. than directing 15 kids every day for Mm -hmm. a month. And I lost Mm -hmm. my voice very quickly in the process. And I really needed help. And I had made friends with these two fellows, Mark and Scarth, and another friend of theirs from college, Amy. They were about to embark on this journey around the world. They had been living and working in Santa Barbara for a year after they went to college down south. And I met them through mutual friends in Santa Barbara and um, just really connected with them and stayed connected while they were traveling the world. When Mark came back to visit after his year there, he was kind of like, he was kind of levitating and glowing. Like I hadn't really experienced or witnessed anything like this before. He had been meditating with the Dalai Lama. It was something else. And he invited me to go with him to India, to which I said, uh, no thanks. Because I actually had sworn years ago I would never go to India. I was afraid of ever, like, I was just, I, I didn't have wanderlust. And it's advanced. India is advanced wanderlust. It's advanced. It is. 
And I had had friends in college who had these amazing stories and also talked about getting really sick when they were there. And that was why I had yeah. sworn not to go. I was really trained by my uh, physician father, whose father had been a survivor of World War I in the trenches. And he was like totally against ever getting a germ or getting sick or anything that <laughs> might like <laughs> compromise one's health. So I was really trained to like... But within a month, I was packing my bags and I went off to India with Love Mark. It. And so anyway, I, I went off to India. And so really, my, my decision had a lot to do very much, like kind of everything to do with the fact that I was still struggling with having lost my voice for a year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my hands were in all the pots and I didn't know how to prioritize. I would wake up every morning kind of pulling my hair out and sometimes even like screaming first thing in the morning because I could not decide what to do. I had so many interests and that's still true, but what I didn't have was a spiritual practice that would allow me mm -hmm. to ground in calm and clarity and be able to discern like what was the next best or the next right move. And as a creative person, I think we really need, we need a foundation of spiritual practice to be able to thrive and grow ourselves into who we dream of becoming and just seeing how grounded and like crystal clear Mark was after having been studying meditation with the Dalai Lama I I could not say no when he invited me to go and it, it was the best thing I ever did I really did put everything down I learned how to meditate I I cried for like six months straight and I <laughs> I just realized there was a lot of stuff from like early childhood that I had never looked at or processed and it was it was running me and I got to start to unpack that and um, grapple with it and learn how to develop compassion for myself and for everyone else and really come through that and then be able to have a really productive kind of calm and centered really fun creative life like stemming from that. And maybe being able to be in a foreign country with only your backpack, which is something that I've done. Mm. I've been to 35 foreign countries. Oh, wow. With just a backpack so that you don't have your distractions to help you run away. You just got you. Yeah, there's a lot of medicine in just leaving the place you know. And so it was there that you start this organization that still exists today. So the nonprofit mm -hmm. is called the Earthville Network, which definitely still runs today. There are many projects under the umbrella of the Earthville Network. One of them was the 60-seater community cafe. People in the community really wanted um, a place where traveling volunteers could go to plug in quickly instead of knocking on doors and by the time they get placed, it's time for them to leave. And the Dalai Lama had been saying, we need more vegetarian restaurants. And so Mark and Scarth decided to build a vegetarian restaurant that housed a volunteer clearing house and would attract volunteers in the first place. And it was there that you wrote the record Skyland. For me to hear that, I was traveling, and I never travel with any music but maybe one or two albums. I give myself two records to travel with, and that way I'm limited in what I can hear. It makes my whole record collection that much more precious when I get back home. Mm. But the other thing that happens is that when I get home, if I listen to one of those two records again, it puts me back in that place. Oh, that's so cool. And so this time I was traveling with a record of mantras by Deva Primal and Mitten and Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life. So I had those two. And then you got in touch, asked me to play a show. I said, send me the record. I'm traveling, but I'll learn it while I'm out here. Oh, that's right. And you sent Skyland, and that became This Is Europe 2015. But it's that record is such a an exploration in meditation, and your experience in India is really raw and intimate and fresh, but the record itself is super polished and professional. It's got this sensibility to it. So it's this wonderful mix of raw honesty and freshness with this kind of cap of mm, beautiful pop gloss. Mm, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Really, I wrote those songs as a way to remember the insights that I was having as a first-time meditator. 
It was your travel record. <laughs> yeah. It it really was. A jam session that Mark and Scarth and I were having on one rare occasion when we weren't running the restaurant, we got together and started jamming, and that became the foundation for the song. But then I wrote lyrics for a friend who had been struggling with a lot of things that I had been struggling with, and I wrote it as encouragement for her to step back and see what was possible with just a slight shift in perspective or attitude. And it it really is, like, it really can be the difference between same planet or different universe. Like, you can be living your same life, but if you shift your perspective, like, a whole universe of contrast opens up to you. And you can be living in a completely different way, even though from the outside it doesn't look any different. But on the inside, you've revolutionized your own experience. So you play a pretty amazing role in the band, Fels, and I know to the extent that some people confuse the Dara Ackerman band with Felsen, but they're two different bands, and you have two very different parts to play in each. Yeah. How do you call your role in Felsen? Um, I have a lot of names for my role. Backup singer, den mother, sometimes Andrew calls me things like car mechanic, the band's blacksmith. <laughs> but also I'm kind of like shamanic go-go dancer. That's pretty fitting. Of all the things you just recited, shamanic go-go dancer kind of says it all. Yeah, that's really how I feel. Andrew, the leader of the band, will give you part ownership of that damn stage, which is a beautiful thing to see from a front man. Yeah, I agree. He's very generous. And everybody works really hard. Yeah, everyone's just like sweating their brains out up there and playing just as if there's no freaking tomorrow. How did the shamanic go-go dancer character develop? I mean, that did what did, you didn't just start out of the gate like that. How did that come about? I had just, or I was in the process of finishing up my first album, Skyland. When Scarth, who plays all over the album, and whose most recent album at that time I sang on a bunch, you know, Scarth is one of my dear friends in the world, and um, also I'm such a fan of his music. Himself, a fabulous musician. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. He's just the most amazing, like, out there multi-instrumentalist and songwriter and performer. And so to be in his band was quite exciting. And it, it, it was also an opportunity for me to cut my teeth and learn how to even participate in a band, especially because I was about to run my own band. And singing in and playing in Scarts band really gave me a lot of experience with that. And his rhythm section was made up of Andrew Griffin on drums, who is, of course, the band leader for Felsen, and Peter Canton, the late, great, beloved Peter Canton. So Andrew and Peter were Scarth's rhythm section. And Scarth, very generously, invited me to open for his band with a few of my songs with his band backing me. So that's how we did it for a while. Until he said, okay, now I'm kicking you out of the nest. Now you need to have your own band. Training wheels are off. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I asked him and Andrew and Peter to be my band. <laughs> well, to my amazement, they said yes. So then, even though it was all still the same people, it was two bands. And I started getting ready to debut my album by rehearsing them as my band 
And around that same time, Andrew asked if I would, or he invited us all to a Felsen show and I went. He's like, hey, by the way, I've got this band. It's called Felsen. I'm like, oh, I'll have to go check it out. I just kind of didn't know it hit me. I mean, what they were doing was just so out there. Andrew would jump off the stage with not just the microphone, but the mic stand and like plop it in front of some unsuspecting, innocent fan in the middle of the room and just like sing into their face in the middle of a song. There was a giant bunny, like somebody in a giant bunny costume showed up sort of halfway through the set and just like stood there for a while and then disappeared. You know, it was like this kind of thing, like what the, what the hell is going on here? The last Felsen show I was at, my date was asked to kind of prop him up on the bar, like he's climbed onto my back to climb onto the bar, and then was like, to my date, said, don't let me fall. (laughs) That was Andrew, with his guitar, standing on the bar. It is such an engaging experience. You really feel like you're part of the soul of rock. Yeah! When you're at a Felsen show. It's what rock is supposed to do. Well said! There are supposed to be surprises. There's supposed to be a little danger. Objects of clothing are supposed to come off. (laughs) All that. And sometimes do, which leads me to the next part of this story. Andrew asked if I would like to come sing back up for him on what happened to be one of my favorite Talking Heads tunes of all time, Heaven. Mm -hmm. Heaven, heaven is a place, a place where nothing Nothing ever happens. You know that there one? There we go. Mm-hmm. So I was like, uh, yes, I'll come sing back up on that with you. And so we met in his studio. We practiced it. He's like, while you're at it, why don't you learn a couple of Felsen tunes? So he gives me the album. He says, learn these two songs. I'm like, okay. We did the show. It was one of the final shows at the Red Devil Lounge before it closed. Mm-hmm. And it was an all Talking Heads night. So all these bands were singing Talking Heads tunes. And then a couple of their own. So we performed that song and those two Felsen songs. And then we had, we met again. He's like, let's sing some Felsen tunes. Let's sing some more. I'm like, okay. He says, I bet you know the whole album. I was like, what are you talking about? I've learned those two songs. He's like, you've heard the album, right? I was like, yeah, I did listen to it once through. He's like, let's sing the whole thing. I love it. Sure enough, I knew every freaking song on that album. I don't know how that happened. He knew you knew. And he knew you knew. Yeah. And I was singing Mm -hmm. the harmonies perfectly. And I was like... It's so interesting. He's so supportive and challenging at the same time. Such a character. Yeah, he's he's a very good music teacher. And that's what he does for a living, aside from playing drums for a million different bands. Oh, no wonder. I'm just going to throw you in the deep end and see if you can swim, because I know you can. Yeah. So the three of us... Because I was very motivated to go tour in places where we knew almost nobody so we could practice and we had the freedom to suck as... Oh, there you go. Freedom to suck. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, it was the freedom to suck tour and we packed it up and, you know, me and my band, which happened to also be the Scarts band, decided to go to Portland where we had a small handful of friends and Andrew had some friends there too. So, but anyway, all three of, all three bands decided to go and my first... Felsen show was at this very famous, I don't even remember the name of it, some extremely famous Portland club that Felsen had wanted to play at forever, but it was in the middle of a snowstorm. Of course it was. And the only people in the whole club was the band and one friend. <laughs> and No rabbits, no bunnies. And he, he hands me the mic, he's like, say something funny. I'm like, uh, I don't know what the hell to say. And I did my best to, you know, at least sing the songs And then the next night was this gig that myself and Scarth had arranged. And that night, my band played. Then Scarth Lock played. Then Felsen played. And I just didn't really know what Felsen was about until that night. Even though I had seen them and I played in that show the night before, people were going, they were freaking losing their shit. Pardon my saying. Nice. Um, People were hurling first it was sweaters then it was shirts i don't really know if it was bras flying or Mm -hmm. not but it it should it could have been it should have been may as well and andrew was climbing up yeah on this this giant tower of these like cardboard boxes and playing his guitar like way up at the ceiling we were it was like kind of a like a 
converted warehouse into a tea house. So there was still all this like warehouse stuff around. People were just going absolutely buggy. And I was, I was dancing pretty crazy. And then you know, we all packed it up and went home. I think we all went dancing at some disco for hours and hours after that why, too. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, we were really stirred up. <laughs> so then not long after that was the, right, the release party for Felson's fourth album. I don't know how to talk anymore. The album that I was learning those songs from. And Andrew invites me to sing in the show. And the show was with Brad Brooks and we became owls and it was at the rickshaw stop and it was freaking packed. And that is a big club. And yeah, and we're all backstage. Scarth is there. He says to me, you know that night in Portland? I'm like, yeah. He says, you were only giving about 60%, weren't you? And I was like, how could you tell? He said, well, first of all, I know you, but I think, I think you can, I think you give a lot more than that. And you were probably not wanting to upstage Andrew. Yeah, actually, that was, that was it. And I told him, I told him that. Yeah, totally get it. Mm -hmm. And he said, ask him, because I think you should give 100% out there tonight. I'm like, oh, no, no, I can't. I can't ask him. He's like, no, go ask him. So I did. And he's like, oh, yeah, everyone in this band is flying their freak flags. Go for it. So nice. when we got on stage, I really, I cut loose like I probably never have in my life. That show was so incredible. There were probably, it seems like there were about 10 of us on stage. Adam Rossi was playing. There were a bunch of other people who don't normally play in the band on stage with us. And there was a projection of the film Koyanis Katsi playing behind us the whole time. And people would say to us afterwards, like, how did you time that? How did you get it to, to get the <laughs> rocket ship blasting off right when you blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's like so many moments like that. Um, Love and it. I think Andrew really has the heart of a performance artist is what it really is. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and that's one of the things... That comes across. It does. That's one of the things I love about the band, because I really, I love that as well. Um, that element of surprise, and you can't rehearse that stuff. You can't. And it's not just music, and it's not just rock and roll. Like, it is, it's art. It really is. Mm-hmm, and so interactive. You really feel like you're participating at a show. Okay, yeah, love that's that. the idea. For sure. Yeah. So I was really like dancing like crazy. I've always wanted to be in, I danced for 20 years from age five to 20. Your major was dance, right? Right. Okay. So I always imagined that I would find a dance company where I really, like there was a rock band in it and where I have a lot of creative freedom. And I, you know, my life took me in a different direction. But that night at the rickshaw stop, I realized like, oh, this is the dance company I've always been looking for. And it isn't even a dance company. Like I'm the only dancer, but I get to do whatever the hell I want up there. It was the, it was total artistic freedom. Right. That was for years. Like that's how I have felt when I'm moved to move. When that band is playing, there's something about that music that is so cathartic and so primal. And it just moves through me and it has me doing things up there that I normally wouldn't do. You know, I'm actually pretty sedentary. I'm happy to like sit in a chair all day and do my work at my desk and not talk to anybody. But when you put me in front of that band, something happens. It's perfect. I can't imagine anybody else in that role. Talk a little bit about Soul Shop, what it does and how revolutionary it is and timely. Oh, thanks. I like hearing that. Mm. It is. I think it is. Soul Shop is a nonprofit that is an educational organization teaching social emotional skills and peacemaking skills to grade, mostly grade school age kids, but also some middle schools all over the Bay Area and beyond. A hopscotch like game, but it's a path to walk. From the beginning of a conflict to the end of a conflict by stepping out each of the steps to resolving the conflict. And then your mm. job, Dara, is to teach, teach the kids to teach each other about how to resolve social conflict. We are workshop facilitators in grade schools. In that 
role. I am a peace coach for kids. So I come in and I deliver a six hour intensive training in the basics of conflict resolution a la soul shop style. And one of the centerpieces of that training is, yeah, training them to be able to lead other kids down this seven step conflict resolution conversation that is painted on your playground like you described so beautifully. That's called the peace path. And we also really emphasize how to be a friend, how to look for kids who need a friend, how to approach other kids without embarrassing them or putting them on the spot, like how to, you know, just be skillful and use your heart to kind of feel how they're feeling and develop empathy so that you can reach out to them in a way that they'll respond to and help them get whatever needs they have answered and whatever problems they're having resolved. So we're training them to be conflict resolution mediators for their peers. We're not, like in the Peacemaker program, we're not training a bunch of like junior police. And I ask them in the training, okay, trick question, are Peacemakers kid police? Raise your hand if you think yes. Raise your hand if you think no. And then we'll talk about it. And some of them do mistakenly think that their job is to make sure everybody's doing everything right and making sure nobody does anything wrong. And it's not a peacekeeper, it's a peacemaker. You're, you're helping other kids solve their own problems. And you're just being there for them. But I, I do want to share something about this new phase that I'm witnessing Soul Shop moving into with the digital programs and soon it expanding to way beyond the Bay Area. I'm making an album of songs that are based on Soul Shop's tools and concepts and practices that will go with these trainings that are being developed on film. Of course you are. How cool is that? It's so fun. Oh, this is going to be good. Yeah, I I hope so. And um, I am really excited about the possibility of collaborating with other soul shop leaders on this. And who knows, maybe even other artists and other people around the Bay. We'll see. There's a bunch of ideas. No doubt. In the yeah, works. no doubt. Yeah. If this pandemic did anything, it was get the creative people really buzzed, really creating. Less distractions, mm-hmm. less going out, more projects, more inventions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that paired with the, the rising consciousness that's been happening mm-hmm. in this year, I think has been a really beautiful mm-hmm. combination. Yeah. May it continue. Even mm. after we go out and engage and go to Felsen shows. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dara, can I ask you a question? Have you been have you been invited by Congress to come and uh, do this kind of thing in <laughs> <laughs> for adults? Maybe someday. Uh, wouldn't that wouldn't be it? nice? Yeah, I think you're creating a generation of children who will be very skilled adults. We'll just get them through grammar school. It'll get them through life. Yeah, I I really feel the difference. When I'm in a school that's had Soul Shop for decades and the kids don't know anything else and they're totally fluent in the language, it is a revolution. They know how to say how they're feeling. They know how to ask for what they need. They know how to be an ally for somebody else. They know how to be an upstander instead of a bystander. They know how, and they do it. Um, It's just the culture of the school. And it's not just because they have peacemakers, which is a real bonus for schools that have that. But there's the workshops that all the grades get. When a school has both the workshops and the peacemaker program, it is golden. Those schools, they just function on a completely different level of health and happiness than schools that don't have that. Hey, so before we wrap up, I wonder if there's anything you wish I had asked or if you have any shout outs you would like to proclaim from this platform. I want to give a a shout out to the other amazing organization that I get to work for, which is Monkey Business Camp. For people in in the Bay Area, particularly the East Bay, it's based in Berkeley and This camp is just so beautiful. It's very much mm, steeped in social emotional values, like social emotional learning tools Mm -hmm. as well. Um, But it's all about connecting kids with nature 
you know, the more technological society becomes, the more people get, you know, divorced from nature. Yeah, wrenched. Yeah, I think that's true. And so I feel very lucky to be a part of that community as well. And Yay, monkey business. Yeah. What advice do you have for young people coming up in music? Anything? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm old. Oh, come on. For music? Oh, I am. And it turns out that I was old even when I started. I thought like, okay, I can pass off for younger than I am when I jumped in mm -hmm. at 44 with my first album. Music, like professional music, you can wish all you want that it's not ageist, but it, it is. is. It, it is, is an ageist industry. Mm -hmm. People want to follow young people who are rising. They want to catch a rising star. That's not to say that I can't find my whole giant demographic out there, which I'm actually setting to do. I've I've really been learning about how to do that in today's new music business. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what age you are, no matter what your fan base might look like out there, like how to reach them, you can you can do it. But what I <laughs> what I would say to young people is, okay, how do I learn from you? Like, <laughs> what's you, what's your advice for me? Because it's all based on technology now, and they know all the tech. I really believe anybody can do this at any age if we learn how to use the resources that are available to us now. So it's a really exciting time. How do we catch a live show, Dara? Join Felson on Instagram. That's where you'll see announcements for shows. We have two shows coming up in May and now a possible third show that's only online in June. But the two shows in May are gonna be live. And while you're at it, please find me Dara Ackerman Music on Instagram as well. Dara Ackerman Music on Instagram and Felsen Loves You on Instagram. This has been great, Dara. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Keep a watch on my mind. Now that's up to me. You're listening to The Leslie Show.